alive or do you? Oh. Hey, everybody. It's Lori Peterson with the Capital Film Arts Alliance and our CFA Film Talk program. Uh, this is our way to keep everybody connected and introduce you to some of the coolest people in the industry that um, can kind of share their story. Uh, we are really happy with the results and the response that we've gotten in this. And uh, just to remind you, the CFAA, you know, we're doing this because we are filmmakers and writers and actors um, and crew who are creating this organization that allows everybody to connect in the Sacramento region so that we can continue to build the region and to build our workforce. Um, so your support uh, as a member or as a donor is always appreciated. You can go to our website and there's lots of things you can poke around at and see what works for you. Um, but for now, we're having a blast with our, our digital um, information sharing uh, through the CFAA Film Talk program. Uh, we have uh, uh, not a second part, but kind of. Uh, last week, we interviewed Jenny Church Cooper. Uh, Jenny Church Cooper is the executive producer of the Patriot Act with Hassan Minaj, uh, one of my favorite shows. And she was uh, an incredible interview. And the fun thing about that was that her dad, Ron Cooper, who many, many, many of you know uh, from his days at Access Sacramento, uh, Ron um, was in on the interview, so as her dad, he, he knows things that nobody else knows. That was fun. Uh, this week, we're bringing in uh, part two uh, with Ron's son, Joel Church Cooper, who in his own right is a creative genius. Uh, that's been proven. I'm, I'm now among the fans of the show Brockmire. I've uh, just about finished um, the fourth season and I don't know what I'm gonna do when it ends. So uh, Ron is here again as uh, Joel's dad to you know give some insight and pop in and ask some questions. So we want to get this rolling. Uh, this is live on Facebook and you guys are welcome to submit uh, questions or comments or whatever. Uh, we appreciate that you're here and that you're interested in film and the people that are connected to that. So let's uh, let's introduce Ron Cooper, get him on, on deck, and then he can bring on Joel and tell us anything we might want to know. Hello, everybody. Hey, Joel. Hi, Dad. So uh, this is uh, really fun. Last week, uh, we had a nice conversation with Jenny about her uh, kind of uh, claim to fame and uh, the interest from early on in terms of uh, all things media and the move to LA. And much of that was prompted by your experience in improv after you left college at UC Santa Barbara. Um, let's go back a few years. Um, people may not realize that the age of nine uh, you were given the film Glory to watch and that it impacted your life tremendously. <laughs> yeah, my dad, when I was sick, uh, you know, my, my dad was the kind of parents who, you know, we we saw movies every weekend. We saw sometimes movies Friday and Saturday with our father. And we would usually go to the drive-in and we would go see a double feature. And then when we would go to the movies, we would go see a double feature where he would sneak us into a second movie. <laughs> um, and so we were just a movie going family from, from jump. And so my dad, once video started coming around would buy videos and I was one time I was sick and he just gave me all of the videos that he had bought for the house. And in that was glory. And at nine years old, I, you know, watching glory by myself with a temperature of 102 while he was at work, I was horribly scarred for life because, uh, guys that and movie doesn't end well, <laughs> the, uh, the Black Squadron, who sort of, you know, are treated horribly the entire movie, run up a hill and then are slaughtered yes. by uh, the Confederacy, and uh, they die in a ditch. Yes. And um, I was not prepared for that because I was nine, and you know, the movies I saw, you know, uh, didn't end with uh, the heroes dying in a ditch and the Confederacy winning. So 
Uh, I was I was shocked, but yeah, I, I teased my dad about he never really uh, gave too hard a thought about what was too mature for me uh, when I was young, which I appreciated because you know I saw things certainly sooner than I should have. I, I uh, the true story is I saw Chinatown when I was about probably ten, yeah. and I learned the concept of incest from the "She's your daughter, she's yeah. your sister." Because no one, you know, dad didn't sit me down and explain that concept. And then when he's slapping Faye Dunaway, and I was like, what? What? And then she says, I'm your sister. I had to do the math. And I was like, oh, wait, I guess that's a thing that, oh. Hey. What, a, what a horrible idea that people can well, do this, that. And this is all, me that. Not my dad. This the is movie. all helpful background for where you've gone with your career. There are no limits in terms of your comedy and, and, uh, your imagination when it comes to uh, the arc of a story. Uh, be I think in part because of those early exposures. And uh, I've got to ask the uh, the obvious question, what are your memories of Access Sacramento? Yeah, I mean, you know, my earliest memories really, um, so much of them revolve around going to my dad's work uh, that down there at the Coloma Center. I spent so many hours at the Coloma Center, more than, you know, there are probably people in listening to this chat that were like, oh my God, I spent years there. No, I spent like a decade there. You don't even know. I was the little kid that was like, you know, I started going when I would, you know, my parents were divorced and when I was at my dad's house, you know, three, four nights a week. And so when he would take me to school in the morning, um, we would like, you would, like you would go into work and then I would hang out at work for like 45 minutes and you would take me into school. And so I was just, you know, the morning shift at the access Sacramento thing. I was, I was in a corner. I usually watch bewitched on Nick at night in the morning <laughs> and uh, I knew everybody and I, you know, saw everybody. And, you know, the thing I will say that I think is um, applicable to this conversation is you know, I don't think it's a coincidence. My, my dad did public access and both of his children are in media um, and have successful careers. And the the connection, which I've, you know, said to my dad before, but I think for the audience at home watching this is like from a young age, you know, we knew that you could make movies and TV shows and that there was no uh think there's nothing stopping you now we saw plenty of shows on my dad's channel that weren't great and that uh and that also is an easy it's a, it's a great lesson to be like you don't have to be good to do something you know you don't have to you know you'll get better but just knowing that um you can make your own media and it's okay if it's not great right at the start um i think was i think that's a huge barrier to a lot of people who grow up outside the industry um, which which we certainly did. We were in, you know, grew up in Sacramento. My dad made public access. That's about as fringe of the media industry as the thing you can get. And we both navigated towards it and and we both had successful careers with my sister. And I think part of that reason is just the innate belief that you can do it, you know, and that uh, and that was even my you know, public access was at that point one of the maybe the only thing that you could do where the the tools were in your hands. And you were given training, but now you could do a you you know I I tease my dad sometimes. I was like YouTube put you out of a job, you know. You know my <laughs> dad my dad uh, was a proponent of free media and free speech, and you know the internet, and you can watch a you could watch right now a YouTube video on how to light your living room, you know, with your phone. Right. Um, and so that access is now in everyone's hands. But so that belief that I think that we had, you know, everyone should have that belief, you know. But when we were growing up, it definitely. You know, we, LA seemed a far off thing. The, the industry seemed a far off place, but we knew that we could produce our own TV and you know tell our own stories. And again, a plug for Access Sacramento. It's up and going. I retired, but Gary Martin is executive director, and those opportunities exist for uh, anyone in Sacramento County. So that's yeah. our plug for Access. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they still have classes that they could teach you how to light and teach you how to shoot, and you know, at, at any level, you know. Uh, those are, you know, if you are someone who's a writer, if you're someone who's a director, someone who's an actor, all of that is important, you know. And if someone's willing to teach you media classes, you know, uh, are they free or do they cost a small pittance? They cost uh, 25 to $50 for several sessions. Practically free. Practically, Practically free. free. 
Well, and uh, I'm you guys have a cup of coffee. Because yeah. I, I'm a big proponent of Access Sacramento. Um, I did not have the luxury that you had of being brought up with that understanding that you can dream something and you can, and you can build it, you know, visually. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had no idea about movies. Um, I had a friend that dragged me into the Access Sacramento cast and crew call back in 2000, uh, 2001, 2001. And uh, I had no idea what was what that was about, mm -hmm. but it sounded interesting. And so I thought, okay, well, we'll check this out. We listened to all the writers and um, I literally went up to one of the writers that we decided we liked their story out of all of them. Um, and, I said, you know, I don't know anything about making movies, but I know how to make coffee and I know how to make phone calls. So I'm sure I could help somehow, but I really want to help you do this. And you did. And I did. And I, and I became unit uh, production supervisor. And then I was in charge of casting. And I mean, you take on every role that you're willing to take on and do well, but it was truly that trajectory that um, lit the spark in me at a much later age, I wish I'd have known this so much earlier, um, that put me into a, a 20 year plus career of producing and working in distribution and running this nonprofit. But if it wasn't for Access Sacramento, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So I encourage everybody to take advantage of the services that they have, um, what they do. I did you ever take a class or did you ever do a PCS film yourself? No, I uh, never did a place called Sacramento Film. I've probably been to six or seven now of the of the festival uh, shows. Uh, I've ne I had never lived in Sacramento at the, the, the time they started. I was in college mm -hmm. uh, when they started. That's how old I am since I just we just celebrated the 20th anniversary. But um, uh, I never did one, and I, I was in. I know I walked through plenty of classes, but I never took one. Um, I moved. Uh, I was. I lived in Sacramento until I was uh, twelve, and then we sort of, you know, split custody with my mom and my dad. And I still went back to Sacramento on the weekends, and I still consider Sacramento the place where I'm from, and you know, my sort of childhood home. But uh, yeah, uh, you know. I also just like that the Coloma Center. You know, I, I when I was a kid, you know, I'd go in and and the, the shuffleboard uh, court across the way was just was was a hub of activity and socialization. You know, it was a uh, and there was a daycare center down the street and there's a basketball court in back where I would shoot hoops for sometimes hours at a time. And you know that sense of uh, my dad is a very big you know Sacramento booster and believer in the community of Sacramento, as many of you know. Um, you know, he started a film festival celebrating the city and, um, you know, but that sense of community that happens at that place that Access Sacramento was a huge part of. I also remember in that sort of feeling of, you know, that this is a neighborhood media center. This is a neighborhood center. I, I love that about that place. Like your own yeah. personal playground. Kind of cool. Yes, yeah, right. One I was, I, you know, I was a little Lord Fauntleroy, right? I was a uh, son of the, the boss, so I could walk around and no one gave me shit. It was nice. Yeah, you were the principal's kid. <laughs> yeah. One of the uh, uh, facts that I'm not sure I ever told you, Joel, was uh, the early beginnings of a place called Sacramento and the structure of how to put uh, 10 film crews together and the concept of writing a script and producing it was kind of a combination of what triggered in my mind uh, uh, watching the uh, uh, Matt Damon, uh, Ben Affleck, Greenlight series. On Greenlight, oh, right. yeah. Although, that. although Place Called Sacramento predated that by a year. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was kind of reinforcement that we were on the right track. But the other was going back to your time at UC Santa Barbara where you studied filmmaking you took the one production class they had and you used your childhood memories of Little League to create your first movie, Chen Music. Tell us a little bit about the experience, uh, which really was your first venture into filmmaking with Chen Music, which I think you can still see online. I think it might be online somewhere, but um, I, I wouldn't recommend watching it. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, so I went to film film studies at a uh, film studies major at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I wanted to get into, to, you know, my father ran a, a public access station. I was middle class. You know, we couldn't afford any schools outside of uh, 
uh, California, uh, UCs, and uh, I wanted to get in UCLA. I didn't uh, quite get in there. I got in UC Santa Barbara. They had a film studies department. I didn't know much about it. I went there anyways. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways it was good. It's a very good film studies department, but it's just not a film production department. But kind of what my skill set is and, and what my interests are, it actually matched up pretty well. But um, so, you know, film studies is, uh, you know, we did film history, we did film analysis, we did film theory. Now, you know, film theory, you know, I think is kind of useless, but it's nice to have a background in it. It's nice to have some ideas about it. And then film analysis was very helpful, you know, um, writing essays about movies, deconstructing it, you know, kind of really film criticism, but at a sort of minute, longer level, you know, I was writing, you know, 10 page essays about uh, Mulholland Drive and the, and the use of sound in Mulholland Drive in college. That was very helpful. And then film history was super helpful. Um, I, you know, in high school, uh, I went to school in Santa, uh, Santa Cruz County High School in there. And uh, I worked at a video store where I got free rentals. College, I uh, worked at a movie theater where I got to see free movies. And then I went, worked at a video store, I got free rentals again in college. And so, I was just a consumer of, of media and storytelling and um, and history of it and analysis of it and building that sort of analytical brain. But I wasn't learning the hands-on skills to actually make it because that's not really what uh, the, it's a film studies. It's not a film production major. So they have one production class. I waited until my senior year to take it. And it sort of was a, it was a real put up or shut up moment for me where, you know, I was in these classes and I was like, I think I'm, you know, smarter than a lot of these people. I, I think I have my ideas are better than some of these people, but, you know, until you actually do it, you know, you're a little bit of a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a floating balloon of hope. You have no idea, you know, or, or ego, if look at it from a negative perspective, you think you're better than someone, but you have nothing to back it up. What are you really basing that on? You know? So, um, I wrote a, you know, they, they had to select a script. So I wrote a script and they selected it. And then I got to make a movie for a year. Um, and that, and to me, that was really like, well, if this is good, then I should really, I was planning, I mean, I was a film studies major. I was planning on moving to LA, but the back of my mind was always, um, maybe this is not the best idea. Maybe, you know, you know, cause I, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted to pursue it if I had an, an ability for it. And then, uh, and making it, I felt I had an ability in aspects of, of production and, uh, you know, movie making. And then, um, and I can say, like, I thought the script was good and I was able to improvise on set very well. Um, I didn't have a particularly good eye as a director. Um, and our DPs were terrible, so that doesn't look great. And we shot a lot that we had to throw away. We shot on film, which was really stupid, because even I, I this is 2003. And I was like arguing with my film teacher. I was like, this is the last time I'm going to shoot on film. No one will ever make me shoot on film again. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. There's like the red camera existed, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, why am I, why am I cutting a negative in a, like a safe room, you know? <laughs> we got on film, like, uh, which, you know, he was like, no, you'll, it'll be a, a good thing. For, it never has come up again. It like, you know, like when they say like calculus never comes up again in life. You had to on to film never came up again. Raise the money for the film stock though. Yes, we had to raise the money from the film stocks. We had to ask all our relatives, which, you know, that's great. Uh, begging for money for film stock when you could just shoot on DV tapes. But um, uh, so we shot it and I didn't have a, a particularly fine ability for, I didn't have an eye. I don't think I still have an eye, but I'm better now, but I don't direct. But, um, but there's you know who to hire. That's the difference. But you what? Hire that has the eye. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the people I worked with didn't have the eye either because they were, you know, they just knew how to load the camera. But the thing I found out I was good at was editing. And that was that was very helpful too, is you know, what I learned about editing is editing is just writing, it's just rewriting. It's the same thing you were doing when you were by yourself. You know, as I'm I mainly consider myself a comedy writer, a TV writer. Um uh so you know, at first it's it's you know, the script is yours, the project's yours, it's on a screen, you know, I'm this is my office. I, you know, so here it starts here, you know, it's just me, it's me in the screen, it's me and the ideas, it's, it's mine. And then you start to send it out to your producers and your actors, and then other people start to weigh in and they say, we can't shoot there, the, we can't get the electrical plug, the, this, the lighting here is terrible. And you change and you change and you change, and it sort of gets away from you, it becomes like a game of telephone. You had this idea, you had this script, and then it goes through all these filters, and then you have what you ended up with. And then it comes back to you. 
in editing. And then it's your ability to uh, piece it back together and rewrite it now. Only now it's like it's like an episode of Chopped, you know. You know, before when you were a script, you had anything. You could go to the store, you could buy anything. But now it's chopped. You have ten things. You have, you have eight. You have eight takes of that. You know, thing. The one thing you thought you shot didn't come out. You don't have that at all. You know. So now, what can you do? And and I I found out doing chin music that I was good at editing. I was good at writing. I was good at thinking on my feet. And it came out, and I thought it was the best film that year. I won, you know, some awards for it. I, I got to see my film screen in front of 600 people and it played, you know, and there were laughs. And I did another thing. We did another short film my senior year that got into a student film festival, at UCLA. And then I saw my uh, a short film that I wrote and directed in front of a thousand people at Royce Hall. And then it played there too. And so that feeling of, um, you know, watching something that you shot that you thought was funny, that you came up with the joke, then you told the actors, then you shot it, then you cut it together, and then making a you know a crowd of that, that size laugh. That sort of was what propelled me to keep going and give me the confidence to move to LA with the hopes of um well, and then also my short film, uh, you know, and this is you know one of the quirks of you know just going to a nice college. In Santa Barbara, is, uh, there were some people who retired from the industry that were living there, and they were looking for an assistant that would be their assistant because they were, we were working three days a week on a TV show in L.A. And so they got an assistant as, a, as part of the deal, but they wanted an assistant in, in Santa Barbara to drive them into L.A. and then um, drive them back three days a week. And they asked around, and someone had seen the short film and was like, this guy's really funny. I interviewed with them. So I was also in the unique position of because of the short film, uh, I I graduated on a Friday and I started work on a Monday on a on a terrible sitcom on the uh, WB network, uh, uh, you know, in two thousand four, and so uh, so I had a job and I had a job. I, I think it paid me six fifty a week, which I thought was the the most money I'd ever seen in my life, <laughs> and um, gave me health insurance and. And it, it got worse from there, but I did, I had a sort of full momentum immediately after college. And then I sold a story to that show. Um, and that show really sort of, it, it was a bad show, but the room was interesting. And it, it introduced me to television, uh, a writer's room, what a showrunner does. Um, uh, and just, I was always a movie person. I always thought I was going to write screenplays and, and, then I saw a writer's room and I was like, no, this is what I'm way more interested in. In this particular show, they had a lot of Chicago improvisers. And I I, I was always a funny guy. I was considering myself a comedy writer and uh, I was always funny amongst my friends and I always chose funny friends. And the, the other assistants and PAs and writers were just speaking a language I didn't understand. And, and what they're doing is bits, but they were doing bits at the speed of professional improvisers. Um, which she just hired a bunch of the, the showrunner, hired a bunch of improvisers at all levels of the staff. And so eventually I started to be able to kind of hang with the conversation and do bits of my own or whatever. And, and they, you know, I got along with everybody. And so that led me to pursue improv in LA and that sort of, you know, forms the backbone of, I think my entertainment career. But after I sold a story, I have a credit in 2003 or 2004, you can check out my IMDb, but uh, I think it's 2003 and my next credit is 2008. Uh, so, you know, that is, I think, a, a certain kind of LA trajectory that doesn't really get talked about, which is, you know, it, sometimes it can take a while. Now, during that whole time I was work, I was working in production. I was a PA, I was a temp. Um, I worked on, you know, different things and, and worked as an assistant again. And, but, um, but I was doing improv almost the entire time. And, and so that sort of going from the short film to uh you know to that show to learning about improv that's kind of the stew that ended up you know being the basis of my career but it took a while you know it took a while and i think some people think it's a you know uh you know it's a it's a it's a, it's a stairwell a, you know a stair where just it's incremental bop, 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 and sometimes that next step. Step is a huge one and it takes a while you know yeah. let me let me um uh double back a little bit to that improv experience that you had, because when I was at Access Sacramento, 
a fairly regular question that would always come up is, uh, I'm doing all I can here in Sacramento. I'm thinking maybe I should move to LA. Uh, I would counsel them in terms of the, you know, the up and down road that you were feeling, um, Jenny's initial starts and stops, and uh, basically kind of say, you know, you're getting a lot of opportunities here in Sacramento, but if you must go to LA, my experience, particularly with my son and then Jenny as an appreciative audience, um, your experience at Upright Citizens Brigade and uh, IO Improv Olympics, I think was really fertile ground for uh, learning rhythms and, uh, you know, that whole improv experience of always furthering an idea and making the people around you look better. Tell us a little bit about how improv has influenced your writing. Yeah, I mean, you know, improv is the basis upon which I do everything. And my career is really built on the the rules of improv and sort of the lessons I learned there. And that being said, I, did, I didn't particularly have a great time at IO or UCB. <laughs> you know, I was on a house team at IO and uh, I was on a sketch team at UCB. And you know, I did a lot of improv for free for a large number of years. Um, but the the instinct that it taught me in terms of you know, one, the, the, you know, I did team sports, you know, I did, uh, I did play football, I played basketball and um, I love team sports in terms of their, you know, we, we share our victories and we share our defeats and we, we, we become, uh, uh, you know, larger than the sum of our parts, you know, better than the sum of our parts that once we can really connect and, and all of that. And I, you know, I, I was always into that. I was always into the Beatles chemistry. I would always, you know, talk about that in college about like, and those four guys separately, you know, are fine. And then, you know, you, I think if you see it in John and Paul's later career, but together there's something, you know, and I was always fascinated by that idea. So once I, once I discovered improv, I just latched onto it and just said, there's something to this of like, of a creative process done in the moment together where we're on stage and we're uh we're listening to the best idea and we're supporting each other and that and then also yeah, as a writer who then you know worked in writers rooms where you have to know when to speak and you have to know when not to speak and that's a huge part of being in an improv scene you're supporting your partner you're adding ideas but it's also like not stepping on each other's toes it's about uh knowing when silence is the appropriate thing too and it's also knowing when you have the best idea. How do you how do you know when you have the best idea? You know, when what of your ideas do you know is the best one, or what are your you still sort of you know mulling over? So all of that, you know, I was an, I I you know I had some success in improv. I did it for years. I did it on you know the stages of L.A. But I I all of my friends who still do I don't do improv anymore, and most of my friends still do, and they're on UCB, IO shut down, but. Uh, but UCB, you know, was going strong before, you know, COVID shut down and everything. But um, my friends still performed on the stages uh, and they were much better than me. They were fantastic. Um, but I the lessons I learned in terms of those instincts of when to speak, when not to speak, when I had the best idea, when was the best joke. Once I got in the writer's room, that was the thing that once I got in a writer's room, I, I that rapid ascent happened. It took a while to get there. Once I did, I had been doing the work. I really had been developing my own voice, you know, pursuing what I thought was funny, and then knowing, you know, what I always say about a writer's room is, uh, you know, you have to in a comedy writer's room, you can either be good at jokes, story, or the ability to read the room and the social dynamics and when to speak, when not to speak. What what are they talking about? Does this idea help this? What are the senior writers talking about? Those kind of things, those kind of social dynamic things, improv is very good at teaching you those things. Whereas some people without it go into a writer's room, they just start yabbering on about nothing and you're just slowing everything down. And then, you know, you're the you're the nail in the tire of the room. You're just, you know, slowly deflating the creative output. So, you know, improv gave me all of the skills I needed to succeed in television comedy writing and was fun too. You know, I drank in bars in my twenties and got to perform with my friends. And we ate shit together and we went out and had drinks and we had great shows together. I remember both, but I always did it with an eye on writing and my friends, a lot of my friends did it just because they loved improv. 
some of them write and still do improv on the side and some of them are just improvisers and they just teach and that's all they love. But I, I never loved it in the way that they did. I always did it with an eye on these, is, these, these are valuable skills. And I was right in that, uh, in that assertion because it, there are very valuable skills if you want to be a comedy writer. Did you write for other comics as well? I never wrote for stand-up comics. So, you know, improv is sort of group stuff and you make it up long form. You get a suggestion. You, you're doing a form that exists that you know, and then you just make it all up. Right. Um, I started writing. I, you know, I did my first sort of low rent gigs. I wrote for the show Wipeout, um, you know, that where they all the people fall on the big bread balls. Yes. <laughs> I wrote on that. <laughs> I wrote on uh, the current TV channel when that was a thing. Now it's uh, Al Jazeera. But when uh, when it was current, Al Gore's company, I wrote on a show for that. That was non-union. Um, when that got canceled, it, uh, I worked on uh, – the next thing I got was Funny or Die. I started doing videos when that was – that was a, it's still around, but and they, they produced Brock Meyer. So that's how I sort of got that relationship going. But – you know, you used to be able to get paid to do comedy videos online, and, and now you don't unless you're a YouTube influencer, sort of YouTube. Um, and people talking to camera sort of took all of the money out of doing comedy online. But when that was a thing, I was doing that. And then I got a job running my own. I, I created the show, Honest Movie Trailers. I only left after a couple, but I had my own sort of website briefly. Uh, or I worked as a creative director for a website. Did that in the show uh, Speakeasy with uh, Paul F. Tompkins. And then I got staffed on a show. So, uh, and then I started working in uh, TV comedy, and that was starting in 2011. So it's been nine years. I'm 10 years away from locking my pension. That's my goal. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's been, you know, it was a long road to get going, but I got in a room in 2011. And then since then, um, you know, it's I I haven't wanted for work, which has been very nice. Well, and more importantly, it seems like you've had lots of opportunities to go from creating comedy for something else to doing something that has a really specific style. You, um, do you did you find that you had a unique style um, that was becoming evident in earlier stuff or? Um, you know, I think you, you know, yeah, I mean, I think what you're going to use the question is sort of like, how do you find your voice? And when you know, you have your voice, you know, I think your voice that it's a distinctive voice. That's yeah. I mean, you know, initially, um, you know, I, I think that when you do stuff on your own, so I also in that, in that six years in the wilderness of Los Angeles, I also doing improv. I also met someone named Aaron Gibson, who's a comedian. She's a podcaster. She hosts. Uh, throwing shade is a very popular podcast um we were we met each other we did we were a comedy team and we did a series of videos called room mating and that which i think she pulled on offline i think she didn't, they were very funny they were very good that, that got us that was the thing that really kicks on my career is is doing these uh web series about you know two people who we were mailing you know we were this is 2000 seven 2006 we were you know a man and woman platonic friends who lived together and um you know we shot it in her apartment and we were the dps we were the directors and we, we tried to make it look cool and we and we got some diva lights and we tried to shoot it well and then eventually when it got a little bigger we got a director who now his name's tyler gallett he's part of a, a team called radio silence he just did that movie you're uh ready or not which we just came out in theater it was a, was a horror movie that uh, was very funny. He is a horror director, but um, so he directed a lot of roommatings. And from that, that was the first thing since college where I had control and I was in them because I, I didn't really want to perform that much. Uh, you know, I did improv and, but I, I, I'm just not an actor, but I can perform the things that I write for myself. And I just thought me being in the videos you said who wrote those? Oh, that guy and that girl. They wrote those. The two people that are in it. So I thought it would help me, and it did. And so that I, that was me developing my voice and figuring out what I liked and what I thought was funny and what worked for me. 
but then a part of you know a part of this business which i think is under talked about is is stifling that voice because once you work on a show you know you you have to find the point at which you know your ability and your talent and the show like what's that crossing over point right like you you go and you pitch jokes that are just things you find funny on a show that's not that voice of that show you get you know fired you have to figure out what it, what are, what do what, what can I do? What is my sense of humor? What do I think is funny? And what is the voice of the show? And you have to bring your voice to the show. Mm-hmm. Once it was my own show, well, then you know, sky's the limit. I could do whatever I wanted, and and it and I worked before I got Brockmeyer. I worked for three years on four different sitcoms. Uh, one, two, yeah, four, four different sitcoms. Uh, two multicam, two single cam. Uh, one was up. Uh, my first one was called Men at Work. It was on TBS. It was a multicam. Uh, I left in season one. Then I worked on Up All Night. That was a single cam starring Maya Rudolph, um, Will Arnett, and Christine Applegate. That was a great writers' room. So I met lots of people that I've continued to work with. Um, then I, uh, after that show, I worked on a show called Ground Floor. That was a multicam on on TBS that Bill Lawrence oversaw. So then I did well on that show. So then he hired me for a show called undateable that was on nbc so i worked on two seasons of ground floor and three seasons of undateable under bill and then the third season of undateable during that um brock meyer went so then i left but all of those shows you know i worked uh under some great writers that i learned a lot from and i sort of you you know you couldn't tell that i was writing on that show it's like certain jokes maybe you know like i would i, I always got material and that's why i was able to be hired on so many shows i got jokes in but they weren't necessarily jokes that i would stand for and would say to you now were the most hilarious things of all time sometimes they were but most of the time i did good jokes within the context of the shows that they were uh, but at the same time, I was learning how to run a show because I was watching showrunners and I was watching Bill Lawrence, who's very successful and has been doing this for a while. He did Scrubs and Spin City and Cougar Town, and, and he was very open about his process. And so I was learning from him. And, and so when I did Brock Meyer, you know, I did have a sense of my own voice. And, I, and the whole time I was in those rooms, I was picking up things that I thought, Okay, I'm going to take that when I do my own show. I'm going to leave that. Okay, that doesn't have to be taken. You know, this this is a vestige of old television that can be dropped. This this is an essential that has to be kept going. And so I was always thinking like a showrunner um, because I always knew that's what I wanted to do. Going back to the conversation about chin music, once I found out there was a job where you could control the story and you could edit, but you didn't have to be there on set and tell them where to put the camera, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to I want to write the script, then I want to talk to the director, then he can shoot it, then I want to edit it, and that's what I want to do, which is what a TV showrunner does. Got your finger in every single pie. Uh, right, but but except production, which production is and I'm sure some people on this chat love production. Production's my least favorite part. It's just nothing but struggle. I say it's like it's a boxing match where even if you win, you get hit in the face five times, and that's not fun. <laughs> Uh, you know, to me, it's about it's about the script. It's about creating that world. It's about talking and pre-production, casting. I love casting. You know what they don't tell you? I think in film school, what I learned is casting is eighty percent of performance. You know, like good directors, they can pull something out of someone, but it's not it's magic trick. It's not like you know all these stories you hear of like a director like you know locking someone in a room and slapping them and then like they you know all that's just nonsense you you cast good actors that are right for the roles and then you allow them to work and then good material happens you know like especially when you're on a, a low budget production like Brock Meyer was where you don't really have time to rehearse or you know you got to move so at that point it's like is it locked and loaded is this person you know cast right and then they just go so Casting, I like a lot. And then, but once you're shooting, you know, for me, production is really boring. <laughs> really boring. You know, they just they, they do the same thing. They do the same scene 40 times from five different angles. And I wrote it. So I don't need to, you know, the lines are already in my head. I know it. I would rather just see what she shot. If I trust the director, which we had a, a director, um, Maurice Marable, on Brockmire for three of the uh, seasons where, 
he directed all the episodes and was an EP, so I had complete trust in him, so I didn't have to show up, which was nice. So Most showers don't show up on set. Yeah. So with with Brockmeyer, um, did that begin with your friendship with Hank Azaria? Or was that how, how did that come about? Because this character is I'm telling you, I can't imagine anybody else in that role. And it's based on that. Well, it's it's a character he's been doing for 20 years. So the character already existed. He brought it to Funny or Die and did, a, and did a short that I had no involvement in. And they did a short that, you know, it got views and it was it's funny. Um, um, and then I started working at Funny or Die and I was sort of there. You know, they had kind of people in buckets there. And I was in there. I did sports videos for them, and I did politics videos for them. And so I did. I, you know, I I'm politically knowledgeable, and I can do political comedy. And and I and I, but lots of people can do political comedy. Not a lot of people can do sports comedy. The, the comedy nerd, uh, sports nerd Venn diagram is me and the Sklar brothers, um, which no one knows who the Sklar brothers. It's a very small Venn diagram. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so I had lots of opportunities, honestly, being a comedy writer for sports is what propelled me in my career, probably the fastest, because there just is not a lot of people that know those worlds very well. So they were talking about, oh, um, uh, Hanks was on a sitcom that he hated and was getting canceled and he was sort of at a low point in his life and creatively. And he liked this character. He liked how the short went. So he wanted to do some, um, he wanted to do one appearance on the Rich Eisen show, which was a radio show podcast. And they did, it was also a TV show that they edited uh, on the NFL network. So it was an NFL sanctioned show using NFL clips. And he wanted to appear as Jim Brockmeyer. And so I watched the, and so they said, they threw it to me as a, you just got to write some copy for him for this Rich Eisen show. I think it was maybe top 10 plays of the week or something. And so I watched the short um to get the voice because again you know going back to the original conversation you know brock Meyer eventually became much more my voice but it's always through the sort of you know it's always through the the original voice which is hanks and in literal voice in the in his you know case doing a sportscaster broadcaster voice but um so yeah for those of you who don't know so brock Meyer is a uh a sort of legendary local um, broadcaster. Uh, I don't. Do they say Kansas City? I think they maybe say Kansas City in the original short. And he has a meltdown on air after he finds um, his wife is cheating on him, and then it becomes a, it becomes a very famous thing in this short. And then it's like a documentary essentially about like the aftermath, and they interview all these other legendary sportscasters. So that was the short. So I kind of got, oh, so I watched that. And then I was like, oh, I get it. It's like, um, you know, it's like, a what if Vin Scully uh, became crazy and just didn't give a shit anymore? Um, but in the cadence and patter of those old-timey baseball announcers, and I'm a huge baseball fan, you can see. Wait, those are three posters of my Giants dynasty front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, I have a Mike Kruko bobblehead behind my on my working desk. So I'm a big Giants fan. Went to the games a lot with my dad. And I and I listened to games on the radio. I like listening to games on the radio. I knew Hank Greenwald was the voice of the Giants. Then John Miller. These are you know two of the best play by play men of their era. And so I knew that play by play voice. I just knew it innately. So I could write jokes in the patter of this voice. And so I did this one off. You know, it's also a lesson in there are no small jobs, you know, like, you know, I, I recognize I was working with a talented actor, Hank Azaria, who, you know, has been working for 30 years and uh, I'm a huge Simpsons fan. So I'm very familiar with, you know, his rhythm, but also just how talented he is. And, um, you know, you go back and you, you know, he plays a Guatemalan is a gay man in the birdcage. He is not Hispanic or homosexual. And you would think he would get denounced. But he's so good in the birdcage that no one has ever come for Hank Azaria for the birdcage. They've come for him from other things. You know, he's no longer doing the Yipu voice. But no one's ever come for the birdcage because he's just funny and he's that good. That like that's a great, it's a great character. It's a great role. So I knew I was writing for someone who's really talented, and I just took it and I just wrote the best I could. And I knew football very well. So and I knew and I just and it was the year of Tim Tebow because I think it was 2011. So I wrote a bunch of Tim Tebow jokes because I thought Tim Tebow was ridiculous. 
And uh, I really went hard on his lack of an NFL career in the future. And I was right. So, um, uh, so it was really fun. So I wrote a bunch of Tebow jokes and I wrote about the other jokes. And the first one went so well that Rich Eisen, the host, was like, can we do this weekly? Hank was, you know, hating his show. He was like, I would love to do this every week. So that season, every week I would write NFL jokes, you know, um, in this voice of this character and sort of developing this character, adding new wrinkles, adding new backstory. And then it went so well that Hank and Funny or Die were like, we'll pay you to write a movie screenplay of this. Um, I hadn't been staffed yet. I wasn't even in the WGA. So the rate they gave me was not great. But I was able to buy my car and um, and I got dental work done and it was enough for that. And I wrote a screenplay and we we got funding for it. Funding fell out in pre-production, which is a bummer because we had cast it. Marissa Tomei was going to be the character of Jules, which in the TV show is played by Amanda Peet. And so I I did this screenplay and, it, and you know, uh, I thought the screenplay came out great. It was very funny. We ran into some problems, which is Hank Azaria and Marissa Tomei are not huge movie stars that are bankable. Um, and baseball is not a thing that people care about anymore, you know, which is an ongoing um, aspect of Brockmire is the decline of baseball's popularity. It just skews really old. And um, so no, no one really wanted to pay for the baseball movie. So then that, so then by that, when that fell apart, I was already staffed on shows I was already working in TV, so it was kind of like, well, that's a bummer, but I already have a TV writing career. And the whole time I was working in these shows, Brock was kind of burbling in the background. Sometimes he would do the character, and I would write for it. You know, we did something for the playoffs, and he would make appearances on TV, and I'd write for it. And then they were like, you know, this could be a good TV show, this idea. And at that point, I've been writing TV for three years. TV was what I knew. Uh, intimately, I knew how to write half-hour comedy. I had seen showrunners do it. I thought I could do the same, you know, a different, my own version of that job. And so when, when they said that, I was like, yeah, honestly, I only could do it as a TV show now, you know, and the dealing of the, of the script and, um, you know, probably, probably a lot of people, you know, they're listening to this probably are thinking in screenplay terms and thinking of movie terms. Um, I would guess because TV seems a sort of a foreign concept in some ways because it's an industry and it's not located in Sacramento. But you know, th there's there's limiting factors to a screenplay of a three act structure of a movie. You know, it's uh, it's limiting. It's uh, you know, you tell one story, and then it's got to last two hours. So the structure of it is so. Um, I just found it constrictive. You know, you find yourself doing things because it's kind of the only way to get from point A to point B, rather than you know that's the best way to do it. And you're telling, you know, you can tell stories on the margins, but you're really telling one story. And what I like about TV is you're telling a million stories. You know, you're telling one season long narrative. You're telling one, um, you know, show long narrative, but within that, you can tell all these episodic narratives and you can tell all these side character stories. And sometimes the main character can be the B story. And sometimes the side character can be the A story and all of that you can never do in a movie. And so once I sort of was starting to be in the world of television, it just was like the narrative possibilities of TV were what excited me and not movies. And so seeing this character that I created in the screenplay, and I was very happy with the screenplay, but it just breaking free the shackles of that one story and three act structure and, and breaking it up. And the basis of the first season of Brockmire is the screenplay. It's basically the first, um, season is the you know the narrative of the first two acts of uh the brock Myers screenplay and then the last episode is the act three uh you know big drunk uh you know scene is is what i had in the end of the screenplay so i sold that and put it at the end of my tv show so i sort of took you know there's a a term a showrunner i you know worked under said i took every part of the buffalo that was usable for the movie screenplay and i stole it I did the work already. It was years old, but I did the work and the scripts, the jokes were still good. And I put them into the first series, uh, first season of Brockmire and specifically the pilot. I packed every funny joke I had, all the best jokes in the screenplay I stole and put in the pilot because I knew I just, I had it, it had to be un, you know, unimpeachable from the, the, the studio, from the network and from the viewers. You know, I had to hook them fast. And so I, I did all my best material up top. And, uh, you know, shooting season, season one was a nightmare, but uh, the end result I was very happy with. And, um, you know, 
Uh, and um, we were a very low budget show, and um, we were, you know, a, a cable show, basic cable show, one point two million dollars an episode is about average. We got to that by the end of the fourth season. Your better shows, your Veeps, are, are you know closer to two. First season of the show, we were eight hundred and fifteen thousand dollars an episode, which is, you know, reality shows cost that much. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a low amount to go and shoot on location for that. Um, and so, and then we went there to Atlanta because the I worked for AMC Networks on IFC, where the show Brock Myers on their small media network, and they want to save money. And so they only shoot walking dead, you know, everything that AMC does is shot in Atlanta. Yeah. And um, we went there and there just wasn't the stadium that we needed um, uh, that was written into the script. So then we had to go to Macon, uh, Georgia yeah. and shoot at a stadium there. And that's two hours away. So we had to put up our crew. And so that necessitated, we shot eight episodes in, 22 days. We show, we averaged something like 13 pages a day, wow. which is not how television is done. And, um, that there's just, the stress was constant. And, uh, and because of, there was a miscalculation of the budget. And then we had to move from Atlanta for half the shoot to go to Macon. So before we started shooting, we were $300,000 over budget, um, which the network was very unhappy with. And, you know, listen, I'm, I, there's nothing I could have done, you know, at that point, if I had been more experienced, really. But I also was I, the by the WJ standards of titles. I was an executive story editor, which means I was the third rung up uh, on the sort of pay scale of writers, which means you're not a baby writer, they would say, but you were a you were a lower level writer. I, you know, I was not a showrunner yet. I hadn't had that skills. I thought I could develop those skills. But I, um, you know, people convinced me to 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 make decisions that, you know, I had re hesitation towards and then turned out to be stupid. Um, and so, you know, but the material was good. The script was good. We had great actors and then we, we edited it well. And be also because I worked on the last single camera show I'd worked on before, uh, bef before I really started working on that show was up all night, which, uh, we would do 30 page scripts for a 21 page for a 21 minute episode. We would cut a lot, but that's what we would do. So I wrote 30 page scripts. Um, and that's just too long. It was just, we, we just were chucking stuff, you know? So by the second season, we were down to like 24 page scripts. Um, so anyways, so that's why, I mean, it was sort of naivete. I overwrote things based on my experience. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, an, it was a very stressful uh, one of the associate producers quit the business for two years, moved to Joshua Tree. Um, it was, uh, it was, you know, our, our our line producer quit working on the show halfway through and didn't tell us. You know, it was just a real, you know, Hank's back gave out twice from stress. It was real sort of put up or shut up, but that's where the improv comes in. You know, that's where the ability I had been doing, you know, web shows. I had been producing my own material for Funny or Die. So I, I, I was able, I the thing that th that I think I had, and I think the gener all the generations after me have, is we produced our own material at some point. You know, we we did we we did our own show at some point. We we recorded ourselves, edited ourselves, produced it ourselves. And so when you do get in a position where now you know on getting paid to make a low budget cable television show like I was, you're able to make those decisions on the fly and sort of improvise around situations. And I was rewriting scenes on the fly all the time. Uh, one week into shooting, um, uh, Amanda Pete tried to improvise, catch a beer can that a stuntman threw to her. No, no look, and it hit her in the forehead, cut her forehead. She got a scar. We had to CGI that scar out for the rest of the shoot. We were like, she's going to quit. Well, the show's over. You know. Then I had to rewrite scenes based on that. You know, it was just uh, it was triage constantly. Production is triage in a lot of ways, and we were we were a troubled production season one. Season two got a little better. And then by season three, we're, we, you know, it's kind of the nature of TV, but especially the way we were doing it, because all scripts were written ahead of time. We shot them all in, on location in Atlanta like a movie. So out of order, um, not most TV. How far in advance? Like right now, you're, you're wrapping uh, season four has just been released on Hulu. 
are you in production for five or? No, season four is the last season. We sort of did that, you know, we wrote it as the last season. Uh, you, know, you know, the thing about it is what I liked about it was we really, you know, metaphorically, I would say we would always burn the boats behind us each season. You know, we would, I pitched them to the show. I said, it's an anthology series with the same main character. So every season we shoot in Atlanta, but every season of the show takes place in a different location. And he's in every, he's in, you know, I think the A story, you know, uh, is, you know, is the primary story he's in of the 32 episodes. I think he's in, he's the lead of 30 A stories. So it's all Hank and it's all this character. And we're, we're, we're doing real character development episode to episode, season to season, mm -hmm. uh, which most television, you slow that down so you can maximize the number of episodes. I was just like, we're doing A to season. It's on IFC. Like we're not, this thing's not going to syndication. Let's try to move through this narrative. Let's try to move through this person's life. Let's try to move through this person's self-improvement. And, um, and that, you know, when you burn the boats behind you, you can't go home. You know, you got you to gotta keep moving on. And when you keep moving on, there's only so many places you can go until you say, okay, it's done now. And, uh, you know, so four seasons made complete sense to me. Um, eventually, I, though I love the show and, and the creative freedom it gave me, and I really do feel like that show is, is exactly what I wanted it to be mm -hmm. um, in terms of message and voice and performance and i'm so proud of it it's also limiting to do a show that is in the scheme of of tv production at the bottom end you know we were always mm. every, everything was limiting everything was limiting and, and i don't mean to say that of course you know independent productions a lot of things are limiting you're dealing with limitations but once you've done it for four seasons and you feel like you've accomplished that if there are opportunities to try bigger projects that was sort of i was ready to move on and try things where I wasn't, you know, all, you know, you're always worried about budget, but some budget is like, you know, I want this and I got this instead. Oh, okay. And some budgets like you, you we, we can't afford, you know, I had to rewrite the ending of the finale of my show that I spent four years on because we couldn't pay $10,000 to bring an actress back. Uh, you know, which is like, well, it's the finale, you know, it's like, do you want to have the characters we fell in love with come back? And they're like 10 grand though, you know, Ten grand's a lot of money and a lot of scheme of things, and the TV ten grand is nothing, especially for the finale. But that's the kind of you know we were dealing at the at the two grand five hundred dollar level. You know we were doing, they were trying to you know, it was just everything was uh, it was haggling. I think the show is brilliant, um, but what what is it the ratings that are not recognizing the investment that's needed to. No, I mean, it's a tiny network. For the network, we got great ratings. We're the highest rated show. The, the, this show is profitable. It's very, at, at the, at, even at the price point that it got raised to, it's profitable. They got a third back from shooting Atlanta right off the top. And then they had a guaranteed um, deal with uh, Hulu. Hulu was going to pay them a certain amount per episode. Okay. And yeah. then they got a guaranteed rate on the advertising. So, you know, don't, I mean, media, cry, media companies cry poverty all the time but we were in the black uh essentially after we shot each season just before even it aired they had already made it based on advertising streaming and the rebate they had already made their money back it's just wow. a very small uh, ifc at this point is probably because pop i think has stopped doing originals so i think ifc is probably the smallest show and i bet ifc is not going to do originals probably by next season um but it was the smallest channel doing originals at the time that our show was on so, you know, it's a cult show. You know, some people have heard of it. It's tough to find on IFC. Now we're on Hulu. At some point, we'll probably be on the streaming side. I think the show holds up well and will hold up well for future seasons. So um, I think it will be continue to be rediscovered. But it was also – it's kind of written to be a cult show. It's not for – it's dark, and it's uh, uh, the, the language is heavy. Um, uh, but it's very funny. And But it's very funny if – you're sort of willing to, I think, laugh at darker aspects of life, America, and baseball. And some people are turned off by it, but I think a lot of people get tickled by it. And and then, you know, what I'm proud of is, you know, we probably, our numbers were never huge, but, but we probably have, you know, over a million fans. And of those million, you know, I, it's, a, it's a lot of people's favorite show. I get that that response a lot, which I would always rather be passionately loved by a small amount than, you know, moderately tolerated by a large amount. Truly. 
Well, I know if I saw anything that had your name attached to it, I would watch it because I'm like, you know, I feel that way about certain actors. If I know that Amanda Peet's going to be in something, I'm going to watch it. I love her. I mean, she's uh, fantastic. I can yeah. speak from experience. But I think now after um, really absorbing all of Brock Meyer and seeing where he started and almost where he ended um, and how you had to stretch everything that you were contributing to tell this story from, I mean, from point A, did you have the fourth season already figured out? I knew, I knew basically the beginning and end of each season bef of the first three seasons um, before we started the first season. And I sort of pitched the basic rough road. And then I came up with season four, probably by the end of season two. So um, you know, back to my, to my remote and did a double take. Cause I'm like, what, what, wait a minute. Did I, did I miss something? Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I knew it was, we were going to move and we were going to be a different kind of show in that, and that we, you know, each season's a new location, you know, each season he's on a different journey. There's dramatic, you know, changes in each uh, season of the show. Um, and that was exciting to me, you know, um, uh, so much of TV is decided by a certain set of rules. And I really was trying to break as many of those rules as I could while still giving, you know, you know, we're just in a, I, I recognize that right now we're in a sea change in terms of the media and especially television and streaming. And we're really able to tell different stories. And I, and I, and then we have before, but I don't want to say that, like, pat myself on the back and being like, I'm reinventing television. You know, what I'm doing is I was steeped and taught by some great writers who, uh, and while well, I did, you know, my the shows I worked on, I think overall were, you know, mediocre. They weren't the best. They weren't the worst. But I worked on these shows with some great writers. And I was able to pick up, you know, really, really great skills by learning from them and listening to them in terms of how to run TV. But they'd also been in TV for 20 years and they started in, in the 80s and 90s. And um, there were things I were like, I can do things a little bit differently than that. And recognizing that, like, the numbers that we got on IFC would have gotten us canceled in any other era. But at IFC, they were so proud of them. You, you know? With content on AFC, too, that you wouldn't, unless you were on. Exactly. I, I mean, we they we say the F word, you know, like the, the they never gave us. There was one note they gave us, which I can't get into because it's it's too ridiculous. But we got one note in four years, and you know we really pushed the envelope in terms of I thought, you know, American comedy on TV. What you know, uh, language, you know, content. I you know I, I thought we tried to push it, and in a way that, not in a way to be like, ooh, we're so edgy, you know, and we're going to try to disturb people, but in the way of like provoking laughter through surprise by talking about subjects that normally aren't talked about on television. Um, and so, and so I said, you know, this era is one in which, as you said, we can push the envelope in terms of content ratings don't matter as much. You know, there is a, um, there's a market for just quality storytelling in a way there wasn't before. And certainly when I grew up. And so I, I just push myself to do, as much new storytelling that that as a kid who grew up, as I said before, working in movie stores and watching ungodly amounts of TV as a kid, you know, I'm familiar with storytelling tropes and, uh, and lots of different stories. And I kind of know when a story is rehashing those tropes or when it's sort of going beyond them. And that was my goal was to constantly go beyond the kind of storytelling that I'd seen on television before. I think are there any questions? Incredible thing with that. We do have, um, there's a couple of questions. A lot of people just saying hi. Um, go Gauchos. Our uh, home commissioner, Jennifer, uh, was online. I think she may still be. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, you know, the conversation um, with her is something we need to get into just because I think you are a wealth of uh, information with what you've done in Atlanta with what you see that city has done in their, in their film industry to develop things. Um, I'm, I'm just, I love that we can be proud of people that are from Sacramento because, you know, that's who are the mentors and the images that we're all going to follow for recognizing that it just takes a lot of really hard work because I'll tell you the one thing I find in talking to both you and Jenny, first of all, you guys are just 
smart, you know, whip smart, both of you. But you also have this stick to in what you've done that has allowed you to just, you know, build and build and build until you're finding your right voice. And I can't even imagine uh, as a dad how proud Ron is to see that. Um, and I'm sure in your days of working comedy clubs in LA and scrambling for gigs, he was not as certain <laughs> of, your, of your path to success, but you you have really proven something. Um, yes, I, you know, I, I my, that can speak. I, I know he's proud of me, but I, I will say that, you know, he never, he was always supportive of me the whole way along. And, uh, he never, uh, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I, what I think, you know, he and he can maybe speak to this, but what I think he always is caught up in is emotionally is the uncertainty of it. And the, you know, uh, you know, Brock and I wrapped a long time ago. I've written two pilots, but I've essentially written them from home. So I haven't really worked on a show in, uh, you know, in over a year. And do you, uh, have, and do you have a gig that's? I mean, I've written I've written two pilots. I've gotten paid for, and they're still yeah. sort of you know, mm -hmm. one is kind of dead, and one's being decided upon. But so I'm working, getting paid for it. But it's not a. It's not a. I'm not punching a clock. You know, there's. I, I still got to go out and I still got to sell myself and I got to sell. I got to pitch on things and and it's not a. It's not a. As, as I said before, it's not a stairwell that you can just climb and climb at a, at, a, at a precipitous rate. I think my dad sort of always, even before, uh, he just couldn't. The, the uncertainty of it always would sort of weird him out. Of like, why would you do that? You know, just like you know it, that you know. I think as a parent, you worry, but also just like. I think he was like, how could you sort of handle that much uncertainty, you know, in your daily life? Yeah. Right, Dan? I think the, uh, as a parent, and I think others listening who are parents understand this, uh, some stretch in that, uh, I think you described that six year period of production assisting, driving scripts all around LA, getting coffee. At some point there, I was getting ready for the, you know, Joel, you've done such a great job. You've learned so much. But have you thought about Plan B? You know, I mean, what what comes after television? You know, maybe there's something else. But we never had that conversation because you, at the speed at which you travel, there was never a pause. <laughs> there was never a oh my God, he's feeling down. You know, he's feeling. Is this my career? Am I? There wasn't a sense of self-doubt. There was always questions about what comes next that, as you said, I would find intolerable. But I would keep it to myself because you had such a belief in yourself. And I speak to that because I think this is really important for uh, folks on an on a upward, upward path <laughs> in their careers. Uh, you have confidence when you go into pitch. How do you do that? Well, now it's based on, you know, actual I've done good work and I have something to back my name up on. And so, you know, but a lot of it's that going back to that improv idea of knowing when you have the best idea in the room, you know, and, um, um, you know, I'm confident in my own ideas and, you know, I the thing I'll say about this is I always had confidence and 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 initially it was too much confidence for lack of uh, any kind of experience and I and I'll admit that in my early going the confidence is what sort of got me through some situations where I should have been uh, wary. But I'll also say that I've always been objective about my own work. And I think that when I talk to people who are starting out and are sort of working on their careers and sort of dreaming about things and they they ask like what you know. What's the most important thing? If you can somehow be objective about your own work, you know, which is really hard. How do you be objective about it? I think it goes back to the editing thing. You know, when when I edit, a thing about me, my for example, my father came down. He was sat in the audience for a shoot in season two. There was a shot where as you passed Hank Azaria and you passed the crowd, my dad was center frame, was my dad, you know. Everyone knew my dad came down that day. 
we're looking to lose time to uh, you know to make the ed- the time cut and that we had to do twenty one thirty one to to make it on time for IFC. So we had to do. And uh, I was like, you could cut six seconds if you cut from his speech from there to there. And they were like, the editor was like, well, yeah, you could. And I was like, well, what? He's like, then you cut out your dad. And I was like, ah, fuck my dad. I don't, I don't care. But I need the six seconds. <laughs> you know, that that kind of like that's how I edit. I kill all babies. You know, yeah. I, you know, my dad's not a baby, but you know, he's a baby in terms of he's something I love very much and that I care about. There are plenty of jokes that, that I nurtured and in the room I believe were the best thing ever. And on set, I laugh so hard. And then in the cut, I'm like, it doesn't help the story. Cut it, you know, merciless. Yeah. You know, cut your babies. There's always more jokes. Objective about your own work. What is working? What is not working? What did I screw up on? What is my fault? Yeah. Don't hold on to the memory of you succeeding and coming up with the idea. Be present at the moment to look what you have and say, this is not working anymore. And that's been the thing that, and maybe it's it, it's going back to the improv thing of like, you're on stage and you're making things up as you go and there are nights that i will remember for the rest of my life that was just electric where everything worked and there are nights where i just ate shit with a group of people that were my friends and then we sat in the bar and the audience would look at us as they passed you know (laughs) failure just just total failure on a and it was shared failure and so that's what made it i could never be a stand-up i hated stand-up i hated going to stand-up clubs but 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 sharing it with my with my team of the failure of, well, could we do better? Let's talk about it. What, what did we do wrong? You know, that kind of thing. Being objective about your own work and feeling like, you know, I, were, I went on stage and I thought I was trying to be funny and I just ate shit. Well, what did I do wrong? What was wrong with what I did? What can I not repeat again? Objective about your own work. Recognize that a lot of things you're doing are bad. How can you fix them? You know, you know, the, not, you know it's, the, your script is not something to be protected until the ends of time. And then you explain it to your, you know, the audience later about why it was good and what you were thinking. You know, no, you cut what doesn't work and you invent stuff in the edit room to support what does work. And you know that I think is that's my talent. I think ultimately is I have good ideas. I can work fast, but I I'm able to look with clear eyes about the work that I've done and know what's bad and know what's good. And that's what's been the sort of backbone of my career. Super, super important. Um, let me see. We got a couple of questions here. Oh, how, uh, I think you might have touched on this briefly, but how did you find the town? Is that for the first season of Brock Meyer? How did I find the town? We so we uh, we I, I invented a town in in Pennsylvania called Morristown that I just thought I uh, I invented some stuff based on you know. My dad's hometown of uh, of Sutter Creek and Amador County in Jackson. I sort of knew small rural American towns from that, local, you know, Sacramento-based towns. And then um, uh, I, you know, read a little bit of Western Pennsylvania, knew about fracking. And then after I wrote the first season, I then went to Western Pennsylvania to sort of make sure that a lot of what I was saying felt true, and it did. What I what was interesting is what I found is that like you know. There's no, there's no blue red states. There's cities, you know, which all kind of, you know, Pittsburgh is not that different from any other city I've been to. It's not different from Austin. It's not that different from, you know, Raleigh, you know, whatever. And then the rural areas of America are all kind of like so Jackson, you know, California is not that different from rural Pennsylvania. You know, that that sort of red state, blue state is a, is a misnomer. It's sort of like red areas, blue areas, all around. So. So I wrote that city, and then we found it in Georgia, in Lithonia, which is a small, sort of poor, rundown, mainly black, um, just a poor, impoverished area of Atlanta, which we, um, uh, uh, Brock Myers, really a criticism of America in many ways and, and the current American trajectory. And so we ended up, uh, we needed a lot of places that looked run down. And uh, we found plenty of them in the state of Georgia. Mm, wow. And the film commission there, I'm sure, is very uh, efficient in. Yeah, they're very helpful. They they bend over backwards, and you have to to get your rebate. You have to participate in a short film. I did four of them about uh, the uh, the great state of Georgia and how you the, the, how helpful and why everyone should shoot in Georgia. You have you literally have to do the video, and by the third season, Hank refused to do it. So I was always. And no one gives it. No one gives a shit. This is Joe Joel Church Cooper, EP of Brockmire. You know they want to see the people they know, but I would give them sound bites and hopefully legally required. 
That's why we do this. We have that legal requirement that um, both of you have to say something nice about the CFAA. So before we. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me see. So yeah, the locations are incredible. Uh, nod to the Filipino ripoffs of Heart to Heart. That's I can remember. Yeah, we had a huge uh, Filipino element. Uh, you know, uh, Pinoy runs through uh, Brockmire. And, uh, you know, we had Filipino writers on the show and, um, you know, we, I always liked the idea of Brock Meyer sort of ending up at a place where, you know, expats kind of land, you know, like he, so he was coming back to America fresh. And so we sort of did the Philippines as a sort of offhand joke, just as a place where there's lots of people that sort of escape their Western countries and go live there. But then, you know, we had writers in the show and the more I sort of, you know, got versed in Filipino culture, um, you know, became a real backbone of the show. Um, and if, I thought a very cool way, including, you know, in the final season, spoilers, you know, his daughter was born in the Philippines and comes to meet him. And so we have a, you know, Filipino American character on the show, um, you know, and, and I know that a lot of the uh, Tagalog is spoken phonetically. And it's not great. So <laughs> I have seen some comments by uh, Tagalog speakers that are uh, appreciate the effort, if uh, if not the execution of uh, of our spoken uh, foreign languages on the show. Uh, one of the things I wanted to jump in on too, because I'm very pleased and very proud of what you and Jenny uh, do in your livelihood, in your careers, in terms of the choices that you've made for years now. I mean, this is not a recent thing for you, but a real commitment and joy in a diversity of voices. Could you speak a little bit about the changes that you see and that you want to see in the production of entertainment? You know, yeah, certainly, you know, um, the, the, the most, the most racism I ever experienced in terms of conversation was in TV writers rooms when I started working there. And that's not, a indictment of TV writers and the, the people that I worked with. I mean, it is, but, but what I would really say is what I experienced was a TV writers room was a very special thing in that it's this, it's a space where, you know, eight to 12 people enter and they un, you know, lock their brains and they just spit out whatever comes out. There's no filter. It is there, you know, cause you're like, is this a story? This happened to me once. Is this a story? This is a thought I had walking on the street. Is this a story? So you're just regurgitating, you know, American, you know, thought that you're having walking around in these streets in these times, and you're just sort of throwing it out on the table. And a lot of the people I worked with were very wealthy, and they all probably voted Democratic, but they were rich white men in, in some way, you know, and that's what they were. And and a lot of things they were saying I would be horrified by. And um, and it just wasn't the way I thought. And I also walked around. I looked around these rooms, and I noticed there was just a lack of people of color. And I had a writing partner who is, uh, you know, Filipino American. And in some rooms, we were he was the only person of color in the room. And I felt because I was his partner for the first time. You know, listen, I didn't feel exactly what he felt. I can't, you know, but I felt the eyes look at him. I felt because we were connected. I felt the pressure that was on him. And he's had a great career. His name is Rene Goubet. He's, he's a produ supervisor producer on Superstore. And uh, you know, he worked in all the seasons of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. He's a great writer. But we started out together and we experienced the racism of those rooms. And you know, there were times where other people of color and, and Rene and I would would meet in offices. And, and the thing I would say is we can't change the system right now, but let's make us a promise to each other that when we run our own shows and we have some semblance of control over the of this process that we change it. And so when I got my own show, that was important to me that I did not enact the mistakes of the people that came before me and that I was from a different generation and I didn't think the way those people felt. I also didn't have the money to be isolated from people of color like they were. You know, you get to a certain strata in America and the only people of color you talk to on a daily basis are the people that work for you, which I think changes your form of thought. Um, and that's what I, that's the way they thought. And I didn't want to have that that thinking in my show. And so, you know, we had one senior writer who was not like that. And then we try to make a commitment for every season to have our writing staff be half female and uh, half uh, people of color. 
And, you know, we didn't make it every season, but I think we made it two of the four. And there was always people of color in the room. There was always, there was most, you know, there's always uh, at least three women in the room. And, um, and what, what it does to me in this, it just makes the storytelling better to me when you have um, different voices representing different experiences in this country, especially when on Brockmire is a show that's trying to really deal with, you know, once we we were a baseball show about um, dying institutions of baseball in America. So I wanted to have as many different people and their experiences as possible. And what's great about his riser when it's run well, that same thing that lifting off your brain and just the unger, you know, you know, just the unfiltered thoughts. You get a room that's truly diverse and that's truly uh, includes different sexualities, different genders, and you hear everyone's stories. And you get new stories from that, and you get you get different perspectives, and it it allows the storytelling to be challenging and different. And there was no reason that Brock Meyer needed to be um, about people of color necessarily, because it's about an old white guy who's in the world of baseball. But it was important to me that we constantly feature, you know, um, characters who weren't straight white baseball men. Um, and we did every season and, uh, I think it made the show better. And I, I think it made the show, you know, a, a show about evolution of this kind of guy who was in some ways a classic American archetype of reactionary, you know, masculinity and, you know, toxic baseball fandom and over time and through his ex foreign experiences and through the people he met and the characters that we wrote for him, which were written by people of color in the room, you know? with some odd sense of authenticity and perspective. Um, it changed who he was and it changed him for the better. And, you know, I also recognize my audience was a lot of older white men who liked baseball and I was trying to talk to them. A lot of them turned off the show. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen a lot of comments of, I liked the first season of Brock Meyer and then it got too preachy, but you know, uh, we gained new for every person we lost. We gained new people who are surprised and where the story goes and what Brock Meyer ends up fighting for. Um, and it's important to me, you know, I'm, I'm uh, a part of an adoptive family and I'm raising two black children. And, and it's also, it's important for me that my work speaks for the values that I have in my personal life. And that when my daughters, you know, watch my show in 20 years, um, it's important that they see, um, you know, that, you know, what I was passionate about and what I put into the world with the work that I did, you know, that since my father's here and, you know, I always said that, you know, I like that my daughter, uh, that my father um, fought for free media and for uh, people's voices in this world. And my dad didn't work for like, you know, uh, you know, the State Department or uh, the CIA and just, you know, pump American awfulness out in the world. So hopefully, you know, my daughters can say, uh, you know, daddy fought for diversity and interesting storytelling with people of color and um, and filthy jokes. That's Those are all the things I fought for. And from what I can see at five years old, Marlo is going to carry that torch proudly. Uh, yeah, I have a very strong-willed uh, <laughs> daughter who is a very loud man. I always say I could be in any writer's room. And the, you know, some writer's rooms are just like a, you know, a, a musical chairs on land. I got to get close to this boss, you know, and I could be at the back corner of the room and I could still pitch because I have a loud voice. Right. And my daughter is louder than me. She, yeah. uh, she, she, yeah. she's louder than me or my wife. We're both talkers and my daughter can talk. And can uh, she, she dominates, she dominates the house for sure. Oh, uh, just great. Oh, just great. Yeah, it's great. I had one one final question, Joel. That uh, there uh, we've touched on, but I find fascinating. And uh, writers and producers in Sacramento, I think, don't really have a clear picture of. I didn't certainly until talking to you. And that is, I'm amazed at the rigidity of um, the writers' union and just unions in general, and that. Uh, the way you'd move up the ladder. Could you speak just to that for a little bit about what you experienced in the way of how you got into the Writers Guild and what you found when you got in? 
Sure. So the Writers Guild, for those of you who don't know, so there's the, there's SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, there's the Writers Guild, there's the DGA, that's the Directors Guild, and there's the PJ, that's the Producers Guild. And um, the Writers Guild is kind of the toughest to get into. Um, you know, you have to work on, you know, you have to work on a TV or movie show. You have to have, you have to be in the guild to get paid union rates. Um, but once you get in the guild, and, it, and it, it, it's part of the issue with the guild, like many unions, like the the speed at which you get in is we should get in faster. You should get paid more in the beginning. But, you know, until you're in, you can't really bargain for rights. And so that's the kind of thing that I always, you know, for the studios, they sort of give up on the younger writers. But once you get in, it's the best union to be in in, in the entertainment industry because um, we have solidarity in a way that the other unions don't and we strike um, which we are a little bit like, you know, considered in, in, you know, unions in the entertainment circles, our union is considered like the guy that walk, walks in with the grenade and like pops the top off and holds the thing. And is like, are we going to make a deal or not? You know, um, because we strike, we are healthcare is great. My wife, my children, you know, I've had all, you know, health scares and, the it's all been covered our, our you know our union is great in terms of healthcare and then um pay rates you know you get in tv you start off as a staff writer and then you, you get a bump up to executive story editor and on those titles they kind of mean something in terms of how you are in the room but you know i i was you know getting stories in as a staff writer and i wasn't getting extra money you know i was overperforming you know Co EPs, which is the second highest title as a as a young writer, but I, I got paid you know a tenth of their salary, so it's sort of and they and that's another thing is studios really try to keep you at at they they never want to give you the bump to the next uh, rate, but um now I'm an executive producer on my own shows and when I staff on other people's shows I'm a co EP um, co executive producer. Those titles, you know, they have a they have a, um, a minimum salary attached to them, a minimum quote. You build up your quote over what you've got paid before and, and your work. And, you know, I have problems with the union. It's a weird union in which your bosses are also in it, showrunners. I'm a showrunner, but I'm of a small show. Hopefully, I'll soon I'll be a showrunner of a big show. But we're in the union, and so it's not every – not every um, – union use your bosses in the union so we have weird things like we don't have hours restrictions as writers i worked on shows where i worked multiple days i slept at the office i worked on you know and then and then you know slept at the office and stayed and then worked till 4 a.m the next night you know there's no uh you know we're one of the only there's no hours restriction which i don't think is you know most of the jobs have those kind of things and that's the reason is because the showrunners are in the union so there's problems with the union i'm not gonna you know i love i that being said i I'm very glad I'm the WGA. SAG is a union that it's not even a union. It's uh I don't even know what that is. It's it's a it's a it's a <laughs> they don't give you health care and they don't fight for your pay and they just uh it's it's sad. And so and the DGA are just a bunch of shills for the studios. And so the WGA is really the only thing in the entertainment industry that's fighting for any kind of progressive um you know, taking back power from the media companies that are trying to rule our lives and take every aspect, you know, and pay us as writers a pittance and charge you a million goddamn dollars for HBO Max. You know, we're the only people that are sort of trying to pop them in the face. Um, we were in a negotiation that, uh, who the fuck knows now, uh, you know, COVID has sort of thrown a monkey wrench into it. But, you know, the WGA on the whole is a fantastic thing. The, 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 you know, the rights and the minimums they fought for, you know, have paid for the house that sits behind me um, because of the union. And when I look at other ununionized positions, listen, in this point in this country, and we're talking about police unions, you know, there are problems with the union, certainly. And there's even problems with my union, but in most industries, as they've gotten away with the unions, um, worker power has eroded, worker pay has eroded. And it's been a negative for the working class in this country. And the WGA, because we have, we're in a lucrative industry, and but also because we've had solidarity, because we've always stuck together, um, 
we have main we have continually gotten gains every single time, including in new media, which they wanted to screw us out of, mm -hmm. uh, and streaming. So you know, it's it's a changing time. We're not getting residuals anymore. You know, that used to be the backbone of every writer is residuals. There is no residuals in streaming. The money is shifting, um, and so it's a real it's a real sea change kind of time in, in every single aspect of the business. But the the union is together, and we we generally you know for TV, movie screenwriters you know movies are dying. Uh, union can't help that. But for TV, we're really trying to expand our rights and our uh, and our payment to what is appropriate for what the studios are getting because they never made more money than they're making right now. Yeah. Um, quick answer. Uh, so Cheryl Bjorn went and wants to know: Do you have to move to LA to be successful? Um. You know, it depends on your your definition of success. I mean, if you want to make a living doing, you know, entertainment, then you need to work in a city where entertainment's happening. And, you know, Sacramento is trying to get some productions. And there's a place called Sacramento. There's things you can do. But there's not professional productions happening there regularly. And so if you want to do that, yeah, you need to move. You know, if you want to be a writer, it's tough to be a writer, you know, outside of the major city centers. But if you define success differently... I think um, you can do whatever you want anywhere. You know what? 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 The one thing I wanted to say in sort of this is to potential people who are interested, who have a passion for this. You know, there is nothing stopping you from from writing, shooting, editing, and putting something online right now. You could do it tomorrow. You'd have to be like, well, okay, I have my cell phone, I have my house, I have my friend. Um, I have to have a basic understanding of how to shoot and how to light, but you can do it yourself now and you could do something you're proud of that people see that are not just your friends and family and that they respond to all, no matter where you are. And so if you're defining yourself and success differently in terms of, am I creatively fulfilled by doing something that I'm proud of and having other people see it and react to, you can do that anywhere. Now, if you're saying, if I want to, you know, pay for my living, you know, then it's, then it's tough to, to do it outside of the major uh, production centers. Yeah. When you were growing up in Sacramento, was there any other, was there a resource group or anything like the CFAA that? I mean, my dad could speak to that better. You know, when I was growing up in Sacramento, I, I wasn't, you know, listen, I remember when Dr. Quinn medicine was shot. I remember that was a big deal. Um, they they used the state capital as I think Washington D.C. and so I remember we we drove by and saw like uh, horse drawn carriages and like eighteen hundreds like you know nonsense and streets of Sacramento that was exciting. Um, but yeah, there the, the my resource in Sacramento was watching a shit ton of television and and, and me and my dad and, and my sister going to see movies every single weekend, um, and just consuming media and you know. And consuming media with an eye of, you know, at a certain point I stopped just swallowing it down whole and without critical thought. You know, I, from an early age, I read reviews. I remember I read Joe Baltaki in the uh, you know, Sacramento Bee. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I and I always read reviews, and, and I'm not one of these people who was like, oh, I don't read reviews. I read every review of my work. I read them all because I respect reviewers. And even if I don't agree with them necessarily, you know, I – I respect the job and you know, I, that's how I grew up uh, approaching media is kind of through a critical eye. And, um, and so that's, so, so that's, that was my sort of experience in, in Sacramento. And the other thing I'll say for, for aspiring, you know, creatives out there listening from Sacramento, being from Sacramento, I think has been a real key to my success because I feel like Sacramento in some ways is you get, you get a lot of different elements. You get, you can, there's an element of California. There's an element of the Midwest. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's an element of like, you're, you're close to the big city, but you're not the big city. So, you know, there's a, there's just, there's a way to communicate to people in this country who aren't from the coasts that you have a voice in Sacramento, you have an experience that can relate to, I think people outside of the major metropolitan areas, because, you know, Sacramento is a big city in some ways, in some ways it's not, you know, 
And so you have the ability to speak to both places. Yeah. Um, you know, I did improv for a long time. And everyone always knew I was from Chicago because I had sort of a Midwestern vibe. And I'd always be like, oh, it's because I'm from Sacramento, which is the Chicago, you know, it's the Midwest of California. <laughs> it's not like Greta Gerwig. <laughs> it's like uh, don't get me started. I, I Listen, I thought I was going to write uh, the great independent film about growing up middle class in California near the fabulous 40s and wanting to, uh, you know, and want, striving for bigger things and wondering if you can make it. And I saw Lady Bird and I was like, well, she fucking, per like, <laughs> perfect. She, <laughs> I live that. And I can, that's what I kept people be like, oh, Lady Bird. I was like, shut the fuck up. Listen, I lived that life and she nailed it. Nailed it. She got everything right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she got everything from the perspective. She just, you know, and I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I love Little Women. I think she's about as good as it gets in terms of uh, commercial filmmaking, screenwriting, uh, you know, and she doesn't forget her roots either. And I think if you, I'm sure she's given plenty of interviews where she talks about where she's from, the perspective Sacramento gave her. And the perspective that being from a place like Sacramento, when you go to LA, when you go to New York, if you remember where you're from, I think it gives you a grounding and it gives you a, an ability to see that, like, you know, what what I always hated when I worked in sitcom rooms and I watched sitcoms is every sitcom does the same story, which is like, um, uh, once we, we got to get our kids in this fancy preschool, which is not really a thing. You know, it's a thing in LA, it's a thing in New York, it's a rich person's thing. So everyone in these writers' rooms, once they get to a certain level, they're like, "Oh, I got to get my kid in this preschool. I got to write a letter to this preschool." That's a story, and it's like, "No, it's a story because you live in Brentwood, and every everyone in Brentwood's arguing about this thing." When you're living in Sacramento, when you're living in Boise, when you're living in you know other areas of this country, getting into the fancy preschool is not a story. It's not. It's not something that is keeping you up at night, and if it is, you know, there's something wrong. So. <laughs> I always try to push back against that kind of, you know, insular thinking in writers rooms. You know, I always just try to say like, well, who's supposed to give a shit about this in terms of character, in terms of story? Why would someone give a shit about this? Like answer that question. I know you give a shit about this, but why would your average viewer care about this story, about this person? And I think some, a lot of bad storytelling happens when no one asks that question in a room and they just sort of just continue, you know? They're checking the box. They're just getting from point A to point well, They're like, this is real to me. And, and they, you know, the, the, what's yeah. nice about working in a lucrative industry, sometimes if you work long enough, you make a lot of money. I haven't done that yet, but I hope to someday. And when you work for 20 years, you make a lot of money. You, you've lost the touch. You've lost... Um, you know, I remember I mentioned Bill Lawrence, who's a very successful showrunner that I worked under, and there was a joke I had the uh, uh, with the, the the sitcom I wrote for him, Undateable, took place in a bar. There was a joke that I wrote that had as part of it PBR, you know, um, Paps Blue Ribbon, and he was like, "No one drinks PBR anymore," and I was like, "Well." It, it had a comeback like 10 years ago as like a cheap beer. This was this joke was probably five years ago. Maybe now you'd argue no one drinks PBR anymore. This is a joke five years ago. And I was like, it's a little dated as a joke, honestly, because I kind of peaked as a cheap beer in like 2008, but this is like 2013, so four, uh, 2015. So like people still get it. PBR is a thing. And he's like, PBR is not a thing. <laughs> When's the last time that Bill Lawrence, who lives in Brentwood, has been to a bar where they serve cheap beer? probably 20 years. So he had no idea. And we, he would go around the room. If you've been at a bar with PBR and everyone would say yes. And he would be like, no, you guys are wrong. You guys are too, uh, you, you're not representative of the, of the real audience. He would, he really believed somehow still that he had a connection to the real people from his Brentwood estate that we didn't being poor staff writers. So then he was like, this joke is going to die because no one's going to get what PBR is. So then, it, you know, and, and he keeps turning to me as if, like, you're fucking PBR joke. And I was like, I don't even like this joke. I'm doing this joke because it's the show. But if the argument we're having is no one knows what PBR is, you're wrong and you're out of touch because you're rich. So then we, uh, he's like, all right, I'm going to let it ride just for the show night. Show night comes. The joke gets a perfectly fine reaction. It's in, It ends up making the episode because people know what PBR is. He looked at me and goes, eh. Like he still wouldn't give it up, but, and, but you know, but we had shared a look that my look was like, yeah, you know, yeah. and 
uh, that's the thing about a writer's room is like, and and going back to the Sacramento of it all is I try to remember what it was like growing up, what it was like being passionate about something, you know, what it was like to be outside of an entertainment bubble. And, and being from Sacramento, I think gives me a very, uh, on LA perspective, you know, um, about that. And so I've always sort of relied on that and tried to tap into that, um, experience and way of thinking that I grew up on, you know, of, uh, you know, I listen, I love being from Sacramento. I go back there often. I take my family back there, but I do always think it's funny when, uh, when I was growing up, people were like Sacramento's great. It's two hours from everywhere, you know. It's two hours from uh, Lake Tahoe. It's two hours from San Francisco. Like you get the skiing, you get the beach. It's two hours. And even as a kid, I was like, "That's not a selling point. It's not a selling point that other places that are great are close. We got to start selling that we're great for filmmaking, though." Well, you know, sure, um, but uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I I think it keeps me out of the being. I'm I I you know. I, Sacramento and, and the identity of Sacramento being from there is a, is, a, is I think is a huge part of my career and and you know I wrote a lot about uh, in, in the screenplay and some in the movie and some of the TV show about Kansas City and and sometimes people would be like how'd you get all these Kansas City specifics and I was like I'm just writing Sacramento <laughs> I'm just writing what it's like to be from a mid sized city in America because they're not that you know I I threw in references to barbecue because of Kansas City but like that perspective of we're not the major media center. We are the biggest thing in our locality. You know, I sort of, I got, you know, my wife's from Lowell, Massachusetts, which is right outside of, you know, it's a half hour, 40 minutes out of Boston. It's a city of a million people that, that you know, it, it has its identity in some ways as a second city, you know, which I feel Sacramento in some ways does because it's so close to, you know, as great as Sacramento is, you know, one of the great cities of the world is 90 minutes down the road. And so it's kind of always living in the shadow of San Francisco in that way. And yeah. I've always sort of used that in my writing for sure. Well, what I want to hope that you can do is keep in mind, as Greta did, how you can insert Sacramento to continue the, the branding that we have to do to, you know, promote what we have here and what the city is about not just from a standpoint of production value, but from, you know, actual production hub and development. And that's what we want to talk to you more about that. And I think that's a whole different conversation that we should be having with, um, well, I think Jennifer's still on the line. Uh, there's a couple of questions I want to get to just before we wrap up. And honestly, I could talk to you all night because I really want to know what happens next. <laughs> um, so do I. I, on the show, I've only, you know, I'm on. Oh like, yeah, well, you gotta watch. It's all on Hulu now, four oh, seasons. Yeah, I'm already blown away. Uh, I so, just look for commercial-free Hulu. These are 23 to 25 minute episodes, and without commercials, yeah, they, they improve drastically. There are so oh, many no. ISC slots for commercials, but well, my that, dad is one of the only people that still watches things linearly on, uh, like <laughs> as they play. Yeah. Uh, it's it's meant to be binged. You know, I wrote the show knowing that the, for the life of it, it was going to live online, the stream, and so it's meant to be. You know, it's it's a it's a very bingeable show. It was never meant for broadcast, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going back to the conversation about shooting in, you know, having a production center in Sacramento. You know, the tricky thing is just the economics of it. You know, um, uh, California has a rebate now, um, but it, but it's a lottery and it's very small. And, um, and so, you know, shooting in Sar Sacramento is less expensive than shooting in LA. But then if you're talking about traveling people to that spot, those, uh, cost of living, uh, decreases, you know, uh, get eaten up by traveling cast and crew. And so it, it's difficult when essentially, you know, for flying and driving, it's, you know, Similar to going to New Mexico to going to Sacramento. Well, why would you go to Sacramento? We would go to Albuquerque when there's already a production or a crew base, you know? Um, so that's what's tricky. Uh, but I would say there is a, you know, um, there is a, a, a current moment, I think, to, to lure productions. You know, uh, Sacramento's success in sort of keeping the COVID rates down uh, versus uh, other cities of its size and within California itself is remarkable. I think speaks to the city and the leadership and the the healthcare infrastructure there, 
and having a town so close to uh, the the you know uh, L.A. but cheaper than the Bay Area that the rates are that low, you know, I think you could probably steal a couple of productions, honestly. Yeah. Um, that should be something that, you know, the film commissioner is thinking about. Um, cause it's a great, you know, it's going to be tough to film in LA. It just really is the, the, you know, we're not, um, Arizona currently, we're not Florida. It's not skyrocketing, but it hasn't gone down. We're just a big city that, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's tw 20 million people in LA County. Yeah. And, um, and so it's 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 the size of a you know a mid-sized European country, yeah. <clears throat> so it's tough to keep it lo really low. And Sacramento is just so much lower that I think when you're talking about insurance rates and you're talking about um, not having to shut down production, that kind of thing is a huge benefit. And maybe if there could be a couple productions that shoot there and a crew base starts up, because um, you know there's probably a crew base in San Francisco that they could probably hire out as a local. If they have a place to crash in Sacramento, I think you know. But you're talking actual crew base in Sacramento. I mean, you know, if 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 you're a, uh, it's tough. I don't know if you have those skills. You know, you kind of got to go where the work is. So it's tricky. I, you know, I don't I don't have the answers to that. I I know the reasons people don't shoot there. I can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, and it's because of the cost, and it's because of lack of a rebate, and it's because you probably have to travel crew in. So I don't know the necessarily the the long term the solutions to that but um i think in the in the short term i think uh there can be productions in sacramento because of um how safe it is there uh compared to la county um uh, production during covid and where is the industry going i'll yeah. tell you what crafty's dead um uh crafty crafty is the uh craft services era everyone just like takes you know uh carrots and just dips it into the dip and then puts the carrot back and then eats the chips out of the bowl and you know you got best boys and actors you know you know eating the same sandwich that shit's gone yeah. uh, there is no communal food anymore um i think you're probably going to see a lot of um uh wide shots with two people in the frame that aren't actually in there at the same time and you're going to see coverage on people that there's a stand in reading lines seven feet behind the camera. Um, I think you're going to see uh, less. I mean, crowd scenes are going to be CGI. You know, you're not going to see a crowd scene for probably at least, a, you know, a year more. Um, you're going to see less older actors. Older actors are and are not going to be able to get insured in the same way. Um uh, I think the people work around it. We got smart people, creative people. They're going to figure out workarounds, but um, you know, there, there's going to be changes in the way things are done uh, until there's a vaccine, which I think, you know, every way of life is that way, but also there's going to be a lull be everyone that's just get gorging on all this streaming content and all these movies right now, get ready because in about six months, you're not going to see anything new for like a year. Yeah. Uh, someone I saw someone said Filipino in the yeah, somebody comes up on the Filipino and, yeah listen um, there yeah. there there's no more uh probably you know I think in the in the history of television we got to be a top five show where Tagalog is spoken there's a lot of Tagalog on our show <laughs> okay so we got one um very thoughtful question I'm gonna pr I'm gonna put it up there so you can see it and then um, we can start to wrap and again I could carry this on all the time and this is not the only conversation and we definitely want to bring you into any efforts to build. And yeah. I mean, this is a question that, 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 so everyone can see the question, so I don't have to repeat it. Right. Um, yeah. Let me, let me read it just to make sure what's the okay. best to protect a series Bible when you send it over email after it's been requested by a known entity, even if it's registered with the uh, WGA and DC offices, it is hard to control where it goes. What are ways you protect written ideas slash concepts when bouncing ideas around? That's a great question. And we have table script reads and things that we do with our writers group that that question comes up all the time. I don't want to share. If I share, I'm giving away my intellectual. Yeah. So I, I guess this is a question that comes up every time, you know, I talk to sort of uh, new writers and uh, people starting out and, um, and I don't want to dismiss it out out outright because I will say that people steal ideas. You know, people steal ideas. That is a thing that happens. It's not made up. 
your worry, Alex Greenlee, is not 100% unjustified. Um, what If you register with the WGA and the DC offices, I think that means just like a general like patent kind of thing. I don't know. We you register with the WGA, that's, that's, that's as good as you can do. You know, you could send it to yourself as a script um, with a registered mail and keep it in a drawer. You know, you could do that too. But the thing I, I will say is this mindset of um, the fear of someone stealing my idea. Feels the the fear of like, oh my God, someone's gonna steal my idea, and then and then that can prevent you from sharing it and and meeting people and talking about people to people about it. And it's a very I had to say I registered my first unproduced pilot. Like I'm not I'm not coming up from some place of like, you know, judgment that that this is a ridiculous thought. And people steal ideas. But that reservation, I think, in new writers and that thought process can can be more dangerous in a lot of ways than people stealing your ideas. Because how you meet people and how you make connections and how you um, find people that you want to work with is you share your work with them and they are impressed by it and they say, okay, what else do you have? The other part I don't like about that sort of thought process is you're protecting your idea as if you only have one idea as if I did this one thing and this one thing is going to lead to something. And it's, that's not how it works. You gotta, you know, the the great advice I got once is like, you know, everyone in LA has one script, you know, then you say like, well, who has two scripts they've written. Then it drops down 50%. And then you say who has three scripts they've written. And then it drops down another 50%. And then you say who has four scripts written. And then now you're like, you know, less than five, probably 5% of people call themselves writers in LA uh, have five, you know, screen, screenplays and or TV pods they could hand to someone. And so that kind of thinking of, I need to protect, I need to hold on, I need to not share because I have this one idea, I think is the wrong way of thinking about it. You know, someone steals your idea, fuck you. That's a terrible thing, but it doesn't matter because I got 10 more because I'm a writer and a writer writes, you know, Early on, a showrunner that I worked for had this thought process. He called, he said, jokes are free. And what he means by that is, you know, you write a joke, the actor fucking biffs it and he can't do it. And you're so angry because the joke was great and the fucking actor, ah, the actor. Well, okay, write a new act, write a new joke the actor can say, you know, oh, we can't do that joke. We cut that scene. The joke doesn't work anymore. Okay, write a new joke for a new scene. Jokes are free. You can always write new jokes. But that also works as sort of concept of, if you're a good, talented writer, you have other ideas, you know, don't be so protective of your one idea that it stops you from doing the next idea, you know, keep working, keep writing, keep developing your voice. There's nothing stopping you from producing work that you're proud of, then you can share it with people, um, you know, uh, and, you know, if someone steals your idea, it's fucking awful. You register with WJ, you have that written sort of, um, you know, confirmation of that. You have that and they register it. You can sue them. They'll settle with you. You know, you can make some money that way. You'll never go to credit for it, but maybe some way they'll settle with you, get some money. It's not, you know, I, I've known, I have gone in for pitch meetings where I've pitched something that then someone, they hired someone else for, and then an element of that idea has gotten in that show. You know, that sucks. But at the same time, there are plenty of other meetings that I pitched something in that someone said, oh my God, I love that idea. Three years later, they go and work for another thing. They remembered I was the guy that pitched that thing and then they hire me, you know? You start getting protective of your ideas yeah. and you don't share it with people. You don't meet people. You don't sell people on your talent. You don't work. And, you know, there's no good writer who only has one good idea. Yes, so I... I I hope I wasn't dismissive, Alex. Th- those are very real concerns. Register with WGA, but it's a, it's a question I get all the time. And the thing I just want to reiterate is get beyond the instinct of protection and get into the instinct of production in terms of I'm going to produce more and more material. And I'm going to, you know, even the, the best way to uh, have a career is to write great stuff and to send it out to people who believe in you. When, and I have one more only because this question um, came to me today by by email. Um, and I often get questions like this, but this was specific to, I have an idea for a pilot, 
what's the best way? His, his question was, uh, how can I get this funded? Which, you know, very remedial question for a lot of people who think yeah. that people is if that. You're, if you're talking, if you're, you know, if you're talking outside of LA, you know, um, write it and shoot it, you know, <laughs> there, right. you know, you're not, you're not going to, you know, you know, if you're an uncredited writer, you're no one's going to, you know, you can, maybe you got an uncle out there who has 20 grand and they want to give it to you. Sure. Uh, maybe you find a benefactor. That's great. But, um, I would say if you're starting out and you have an idea, see what, what elements are important about that idea, about that idea and what elements you can scale down to something you can shoot yourself. Because when you're outside the industry, you know, it's no one, it's going to be tough to get someone to read your script. It just is. Uh, you can get an agent maybe and they can send it out, but it's going to be tough. But someone click on your link, you know, someone you've produced something. If it's of quality, if you, you know, someone will click on your link and they'll check it out for two minutes. And if it's good, they'll keep watching. And so, you know, my experience of roommating the TV show, that's how I got my first meeting was I wrote something that I was in and, um, you know, Aaron was a much better actor than me and she was very funny and we wrote in each other's voices and we got meetings out of it. And it sort of started my professional career because I wrote something that I shot that I was in and that I is, you know, as the writer was in too, which if you're not an actor and, and you don't have to be in it necessarily, but if you're the one sending the link and it's good, people will click on it. And, and I would say if you're doing a 30 minute pilot, you can do a pilot presentation, which is five, six minutes, which sort of is almost like a long trailer. You can shoot that for sure. Um, you know, and but then, you know, how do you do that? Well, a place called Sacramento. There's a community. There's people who shoot. There's actors who work. Yeah. You can go to a place called Sacramento. You can probably watch the old ones online somewhere. You can be like, I like that actor. I like this person, you know. Um, you can cast it. You can shoot it. And, um, and at the end of the day, even if no one – buys it you have produced something that you created uh from your community and that you're proud of and that is better than a script that no one's going to read you know I mean, his uh standpoint that it was also a pilot what my i i basically that was what i advised but i also advise that you need to have more than just that starting idea you need to have concepts or scripts for you know uh other episodes and if you're truly sure I, I mean that's that's a part of it. you got to think about it in terms of a screenplay yeah. my advice just in general writing pilots is you got to watch the cheers pilot if you're going to write a comedy pilot um if you're going to write a drama pilot watch the madman pilot and and think about structure like outline it scene by scene this scene what did this scene do who was in it what characters did what storylines did it advance next scene do the work get on a page and then think about, and then break down other pilots. The Cheers pilot's the best one for comedy, but you can do Roseanne. Old classic pilots, write down, what's the A story? What's the B story? How do they get from scene to scene? What do they do? Break it down, structure, structure, structure. Uh, new writers, they don't ever credit structure enough. It's structure. It's, uh, it's how it's all built on top of each other. The other thing I'll say is you got a great idea for a pilot. Fantastic, write that pilot. Do the best you can with it. Give it to your friends. Try to shoot it. Great. Put it down. Write another pilot. What did you do wrong? What was bad with that pilot? What did your friends say if you really cornered them drunk and you said, like, what didn't you like? What jokes didn't you think worked? What is bad about it? What didn't you understand? What did I could I do better? Write a second pilot. Okay. What did I do better this time? Did you give it to the first people. Did you think the second pilot was better? What did you like compared to the first pilot? Okay. Great. Write a third pilot. Keep writing. You know, I, I, there's a there's a perspective of people who are starting out, which is like, I did the one thing. You know, I wrote the pilot. It was a big, it was a great idea. I'm sure it was a great idea. But you, honestly, I didn't get staffed until probably my fifth script that I wrote. You know, th that was the script that got me. And the other four were good. And to some degree, they had elements of it, and maybe things had broken out a different way, and someone read it at a certain point. I could have got staffed on it, but I wrote, you know, I wrote two pilots. I wrote a, a spec pilot or a spec script of Modern Family, an original pilot of a different show, and those got passed around, and they got me staffing opportunities. And those were the fifth and sixth scripts that I wrote. And I've known people that got staffed earlier, and I've known people that got staffed after their tenth script, but. Um, 
the hallmark of an amateur, and I'm not calling this person an amateur, but I'm just saying in general, the hallmark of an amateur is someone who writes one script and talks about it for four years. You know, then you're not a writer. You're a person who wrote a script. A writer keeps working. And when you write your fifth script and you read your first script, I guarantee you'll be like, oh, I see why this didn't. I see why this is better. This fifth one is better. I guarantee the fifth one will be better. I guarantee you. Cool. I, I can't even tell you how interesting this is. You're hitting the mark on everything that we need to be able to share um, in the community. And I, I can't even appreciate your, your time enough. Uh, I'm so happy for Ron to have two kids that are doing so well. And that takes a huge uh, concern off of his shoulders. And then sure. My dad, my dad didn't pay anything for this house you're looking at. I'll tell you. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, be invited to Christmas dinner or something like that. I have a chance to get to yeah, know you. He's, he's uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. This listen, I'm glad to talk, and uh, you know, I got Sacramento in my bones. Here, wait, I'll show you. Also behind my, uh, this is a Hidu Turkaloo King's bobblehead. Oh God, I remember those days. Oh, uh, so yeah, I, I got it in my bones, and uh, you know, um, I was born and raised in Sacramento, and I'm I have an entertainment career. It's not impossible, you know. Uh, it's 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 on the table. Um, uh, the, you know, everyone out there. What I would also say though is just like, um, uh, there's a there's a Talking Head song called "Found a Job." I think it's called. And it's basically a song about like a family who starts watching TV and then they hate the television show that they watch. And they're just like, there's nothing on. We hate it all. And then they just start making their own TV shows. And that's, and then the song and then, you know, like, you know, the, the dad's writing the scripts, the mom's behind the camera. It's, you know what it's, whatever it's a, it's a rock song. But the central point of it is I think it's something that like, what, you know, what do you want to do with, with your entertainment career? you know, or, or, or do you want to tell stories? Do you want to better your craft? Do you want to create interesting work that people respond to? Well, none of that has to be done professionally. None of that has to be done in Los Angeles. What it does take is effort and commitment, talent, um, but then the desire to keep going and to scale down your expectations from, you know, I'm doing this for a living and then obviously I love doing it for a living and, and making my living my passion is great. But if you're in a place where maybe you got a couple kids, maybe you're in your 40s and, you know, it seems like I can't move to L.A. Uh, oh, throw my hands up. I can't do anything. That's wrong. That's a wrong way to think. Don't think about things in terms of like, am I going to make a gajillion dollars writing the classic Seinfeld sitcom and start thinking about things in terms of what are stories I want to tell and who can I tell them with and how can I get better at telling those stories? And I guarantee you, you know, when I see the lobby afterwards and beforehand at a place called Sacramento, what I see are artists who are proud of the work that they've done and are feel fulfilled. And maybe they don't fulfill, feel fulfilled every day of the week, but they feel that day. Mm -hmm. And those opportunities are there in Sacramento. My dad's a part of them. You know, he helped create them, which is one of the reasons I'm proud of him. And um, those opportunities are there for you to take them. Um, and, you know, and I'll tell you that, you know, the I, I love that I could do this for a living and I like that it pays for my livelihood. And and uh, uh, I live in a house in Glendale in between two old folks homes. I'm not trying to claim that I <laughs> that I've reached the uh, the pinnacle of Hollywood success. But um, but what really satisfy me is uh, creating something out of my imagination and communicating it to people. And that. And it doesn't have to happen through a professional uh, channel, you know, that, you know, can happen through your own community and you can be a part of that right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't thank you enough. And I honestly cannot wait until your name is attached to any new content that's out there because Listen, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to sell some new shows and, uh, you know, yeah, I think Brock Meyer was great and it, and it really showcased uh, my voice as a writer and, and the, the subjects I'm interested in. And I, I'm, I'm looking for that next show, hopefully at a larger venue. Um, I have a, a pilot at Apple and a pilot at Disney Plus. Both are, you know, who knows? 
But um, I'm looking for something that can, you know, translate to a bigger audience on a bigger medium and still have, uh, I have troll over, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully, yeah, you know, I, I would love to see my name on something too. <laughs> well, I have a feeling that we're going to, and it's just a matter of time and it's going to have the same kind of uh, impact that uh, Rockmeyer has had. And I, I can't encourage you guys in this audience and beyond enough to check out that show. It's truly unique. Uh, it's on all four seasons are on Hulu. It's a complete story, 32 episodes. You can binge it in a weekend. Um, if you like baseball, if you like, you know, political stuff, if you like dark humor, if you like, uh, you know, risky storytelling, you know, I think um, you watch the first five minutes of the pilot. If you think that's funny, you're going to like the show. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Thank you so much. This is not All right, the great guys. It was great talking to you. Bye, Dad. I'll talk to you later. All right. Say hi to the kids. All right. Well, they're asleep. I miss oh. bedtime thanks to you. Good All night. right. We're going to end right. the broadcast, and we'll talk to you later. Oh, did he already jump off? Hello.